this video is brought to you by longtime sponsors of the show, Raycon. So despite trying my best to practice mindfulness, I remain the type of person who frantically moves from one task to the next when doing my morning routine. I run around tidying up, feeding the pets, making breakfast, going for walks, all of that all the while listening to music that's most likely got screaming in it because that's exactly what I need at 6am. Of course, I get through all of these with the help of Raycon's everyday earbuds, so I can just zone out and focus on what I'm doing without any wires, or even really having to carry my phone with me since I can go up to 33 feet away and still have the best possible sound quality. On top of that, these earbuds are comfortable, low profile, and thanks to their optimized gel tips, don't fall out no matter how much running, jumping, and picking up doggy doo there is to be done. If there is a sudden New Orleans downpour, I don't have to worry either since these things are sweat and water resistant. The everyday earbuds also have over 50,000 five-star reviews and come in a variety of colors. In fact, my latest pair are red, which is great for making sure that people know that I cannot hear them. Once it's time to settle back in, I can even use my everyday earbuds to relax and get some rest with their noise isolating feature. And best of all, they do not hurt when I have them against a pillow. If you'd like to get yourself a little something while supporting the channel, then head on over to buyraycom.com slash rainbot, or just click the link down below for 15% off your purchase. Again, that's buyraycom.com slash rainbot for 15% off. Picture this. You're driving along a remote, mountainous road at night with nothing but your headlights to illuminate the path. The earth around you leaves you feeling claustrophobic, but even so, you press on into the darkness, relying only on indistinct radio chatter to keep yourself focused. Up ahead, you notice the road seemingly disappear and you're taken out of your trance. It's a tunnel, and one that you're not exactly thrilled to see. It's old and pitch black. You remind yourself that it's nothing more than a passageway, and you carry on. Soon the moonlight fades and you're left in the void, praying to yourself that the car does not suddenly break down. Your imagination starts to run wild, your anxiety bubbling up as you try not to speed your way through. You count as seconds go by, thinking you surely should have reached the end by now, and that's when you hear it. Now on the other side, you try to calm yourself down. That sounded like a woman's scream, but that would be impossible. Maybe it was nothing more than an animal or the product of sheer paranoia, you tell yourself. You carry on driving, taking note of the fact that there aren't any other cars nearby, and a person on foot all the way out here just seemed unlikely. You tell yourself that it was simply nothing. The story I just told you could have come from just about anywhere, but was inspired by one place in particular. Kiyotaki Tunnel, located in Kyoto, Japan, a place teeming with history and relics of days long since past. While the tunnel in question isn't nearly as old as many of the area's famous structures, it still has quite the reputation regardless, and which version of the legend you get depends on who you ask. If not a woman's scream, some might tell you that traversing the tunnel made them suddenly fall ill, or that it somehow seemed to extend way beyond the point that it was supposed to, as if trying to devour the unsuspecting driver whole. But why this tunnel, in particular? Like most urban legends, the answers vary. Some attribute its haunted nature to tales of alleged exploitation during its construction. Fatalities and accidents alike were also said to have plagued the path's creation, as well as other roadside tragedies once it opened up. No matter the details, people always seem to claim something otherworldly about this place. Of course, this tunnel is far from unique. York, Pennsylvania is, for the most part, pretty normal, at least on the surface. It blends in perfectly with just about anywhere else in its region, but if you're passing through its heavily wooded roads, you may just find yourself at what some people call the Seven Gates to Hell. Several versions of the myth behind this place exist, but their common denominator is a standalone gate within the woods said to be the only one visible during the day, with six more becoming visible only at night. This gate, of course, does exist. Some time ago, I had actually driven past its supposed location, but chose not to venture into what I assumed was private property, and of course, I advise you to do the same. When it comes to the legend, however, they say that once the other gates appear, those who pass through them will eventually find themselves in a world completely divorced from our own, with the fifth gate being the point of no return. Again, you can find stories about this just about anywhere on the globe. 
Sometimes, however, you need not look further than just a few steps away. Mirrors, of course, are considered by many to just be creepy in general. As if the possibility of seeing a stranger appear behind you isn't bad enough, there are also those who believe that mirrors can either attract inhuman beings or transport us to other realms entirely. Another iteration of this type of urban legend now comfortably occupies the minds of millions online thanks to so-called liminal spaces. Now, the word liminal is defined by Merriam-Webster as one of relating to or situated at a sensory threshold, barely perceptible or capable of eliciting a response. Two, of relating to or being an intermediate state, phase, or condition, in between, transitional. Images of so-called liminal spaces are a much more recent occurrence, ultimately culminating in the backrooms, and whether you actually find these concepts creepy or just good meme material, the point still stands, and the concept of a creepy-ass transitional area still remains powerful to this day. Having said that, what might be the most interesting thing about places like this, though, is that sometimes we find ourselves in them without even realizing it. So how does one get to the other side of these liminal or transitional places? Well, as it turns out, some people have tried. Take, for example, the so-called elevator to another world. A Google search for this will tell you a few different versions of the same thing, depending on where you look. What most agree upon, however, is this. In order for this to work, the building in question needs to have at least 10 floors. Whether or not basements count isn't for certain, but it seems that having floors labeled 1 to 10 is actually ideal. Whether or not the traveler has to venture on alone is also up for interpretation, but for the sake of the spooks, let's go with it. The time of day is said to not matter, nor the type of building so long as it meets the aforementioned specs. That said, the journey is probably best with as little distractions as possible. It begins when the traveler steps into the elevator on the first floor. Once inside, they need to make their way to the fourth floor. Assuming that nothing throws this off, they're supposed to stay inside as the doors open and then close once more. Next, the Traveler is said to traverse the following sequence in the same manner. Floor 2, Floor 6, Floor 2 once more, Floor 10, then Floor number 5. This is where things are said to pick up. On Floor 5, a young woman may or may not appear once the doors open, and she may or may not enter the elevator. Travelers are advised to ignore this seemingly human woman, making no eye contact or so much as a peep in her presence. Instead, they carry on, pressing the key to the first floor. From here, it's said that two things could happen. One, the elevator might start to descend as you requested. By all accounts, this indicates a failure and dictates that the traveler immediately march out of the building without looking back. Outcome two is that the elevator might start to rise all on its own, in this case making a second and final stop at floor 10. Travelers experiencing second thoughts are said to be able to back out, but only before reaching the ninth floor. Pressing anything beyond that point is said to have no effect. Now, assuming that they're sure of their choice, the doors will open up on the 10th floor, and the woman who entered on the 5th may choose to speak at this time, asking the traveler where they're going or what they might be looking for. Again, this is said to be a trap, the woman actually being something potentially sinister in disguise. Instead of answering, the traveler has to carry on, stepping out into a world that appears identical to our own, minus a couple key elements. It's said that the other side is pitch black and silent, devoid of human life aside from the lone traveler who decided for some reason to visit this place. Electronics are said to not work in this realm, and upon looking outside, the Traveler will find nothing more but darkness and a singular red cross out in the distance. As usual, all these details vary depending on who you ask, so in truth, there is no way to say for sure what lies on the other side, aside from an uncanny version of our own world. It's unclear if travelers encounter other beings there, or where the lady from the fifth floor goes once abandoned. Chances are she may not leave the travelers at all, maybe watching their every move as they traverse the strange place. Of course, this urban legend wouldn't have any weight to it unless there was a way for the travelers to get back home. That's the good news. The bad news here is that the return trip is said to be slightly more complicated than the first run, even if on the surface the methods seem almost identical. It's said that homesick travelers must make their way back to the exact same elevator they used when they arrived, and once again repeat the same 426-210-51 sequence. Other accounts call for that sequence, but instead in reverse. Either way, there are a few things to bear in mind. 
Past travelers claim that being on the other side can actually mess with your mind, that you might find yourself disoriented or confused, maybe even unable to locate the elevator that delivered you there. Others say that the world itself may seem to warp before your very eyes, the elevator almost seeming to move locations entirely. Sometimes it may appear that the traveler has successfully arrived back home, but upon the elevator doors opening, they notice that something feels off. In this case, they're advised to repeat the sequence until they're absolutely sure that things are as they should be, never going against their own intuition. Travelers are said to sometimes faint on the way back, only to inexplicably find themselves back in their own homes. Some say that this means that they're actually still on the other side, while others claim that this is actually their proper world, but they note that the traveler may now find themselves back in the dark seemingly out of nowhere. Why this happens is unknown, but it's said that some are inherently more susceptible than others. Of course, there is no way for a traveler to know this until it's too late. The Elevator to Another World is one of those urban legends that you're bound to have stumbled upon at least once if you've spent enough time online. And like most urban legends, it's almost impossible to pinpoint its exact author or origin. Our best guess, however, comes from Lucia Peters of theghostinmymachine.com. It's an absolutely fantastic website for all things strange and unusual, but Lucia's deep dive research into the elevator from another world is especially notable. 2014 was the first time the Ghost in My Machine tackled the subject, with said article becoming the site's most popular post. In 2020, Lysia decided to look deeper into this infamous tale by turning to its alleged birthplace, East Asia. Online chatter throughout the years pointed to Korea, which did turn out to have a sizable amount of posts that predate their Western counterparts. One source, for example, was reposted in 2010, and was the apparent documentation of one user's experience attempting to reach the other side. Per Lucia, the post's introduction mentions the OP having heard about the elevator to another world elsewhere online, already pointing us in another direction. Regardless, the post, even being a decade old at that point, followed the aforementioned steps to a T. The OP explains that one afternoon, they had decided to take the plunge, stepping into the elevator of their 14-story apartment building. As they began the sequence, they felt nothing. Slowly but surely, however, anxiety and dizziness began to set in. By the time they pressed the button to the fifth floor, dread began overwhelming them completely, and what they claimed to have encountered next did not make it any better. The poster says that once the doors of the fifth floor opened, a young woman was standing on the other side. They described her as having a pale face, long black hair, along with an older style school uniform, one that we can assume was generally no longer in use at the time. As she entered the elevator, the OP began to panic and quickly pressed the button to the sixth floor, breaking the sequence. From there, they took the stairs all the way back down to the first floor and walked over to a nearby 7-Eleven, citing the need to get away from the area while they calmed down. While this story is definitely interesting, as we've established, it wasn't the first account. Digging deeper, Lucia was able to unearth a paranormal message board thread from November of 2008, and this, to the best of everyone's knowledge, is where this urban legend spawned from. Its origin? Japan. Unlike the post that we just mentioned, this wasn't an account of someone's experience with the elevator, but rather a guide on the sequence needed to reach the other side. Additionally, this post doesn't include any instructions on the return home, and is considerably more vague than subsequent variations. As for how the topic came up, the users in the thread had been discussing time travel, which eventually brought up the idea of hopping to other dimensions entirely. Needless to say, once the elevator method was mentioned, it derailed the thread and caught everyone's attention. Other users began asking questions about it, some wanting the OP to elaborate, while others asked for its source. At one point, one post does seem to state that the elevator method was a repost, but the person making this claim was unable to verify it. Another user chimed in, mentioning something called Mysterious Transfer Student. While I wasn't able to find exact details on this, a quick search online will tell you that Mysterious Transfer Student originated as a novel in the 60s and would find itself adapted a number of times for both film as well as TV. The eponymous Mysterious Student is first encountered by the story's main character in the elevator of their apartment building, where the two are eventually trapped due to a power outage. Later on in the series, it's revealed that said transfer student is actually from another world, but based on what I could find, the elevator itself had nothing to do with it, and was merely a plot device allowing these two characters to cross paths. Of course, this clearly was not what the elevator to another world was directly based on, but we can assume that the user who brought this franchise up might be inferring that it reminded them of it. 
As I looked further into this, I got curious and began searching for other media where an elevator has some importance to the narrative, and to my surprise, there were lists of this very thing already in existence online. Eventually, I stumbled upon this film, which I had a vague memory of, and after looking into it, found that it was heavily inspired by a Japanese property, one that loosely translates to Nightmare Elevator. Just like Mysterious Transfer Student, this one started out as a book and would go on to garner several adaptations, including a 2007 TV drama as well as a 2008 theater run. September of 2008, to be exact. Just a couple months shy of the November 2008 post that seemingly sparked it all. Now, I'm not at all insinuating that this was the definitive source of inspiration for The Elevator to Another World. In fact, from what I understand, Nightmare Elevator, much like the 2010 maybe ripoff version, is about a group of strangers who find themselves stuck in an elevator together. No other dimensions included. Of course, inspiration could come from any number of places, and it goes without saying that elevators have made people uneasy for one reason or another, probably since their very introduction. For some, they're even a full-blown phobia. With all that in mind, however, I will bring up one last thing that Lucia uncovered in her 2020 deep dive. In June 2006, the Minato Ward elevator incident occurred, an elevator malfunction that resulted in the passing of a 16-year-old high school student. This understandably became national news and was supposedly just one case of malfunction out of many for a specific brand of elevators at the time. Now, what exactly happened? According to reports, the individual had gotten into the elevator with his bike, and upon arriving at his floor, attempted to back out with it. Before he could get out, the elevator abruptly began ascending, pinning both him and his bike down. Lucia points out the obvious parallels here, an elevator starting to ascend seemingly on its own. Again, it's impossible to pinpoint what exactly sparked the elevator to another world, but what was outlined here today was most likely in Japan's collective consciousness around the time that it showed up. It seems that one way or another, though, this urban legend was bound to manifest somewhere. New technologies over the course of human existence have always had a way of making our imaginations run wild. And on top of that, we've always been captivated by the ideas of other worlds being out there, sometimes hidden right under our noses. This next tale is no different, but unlike the elevator to another world, we can say with absolute certainty that it was born from real life. We've all heard of the space race, but during this particular time in our world's history, there were actually other attempts by various countries to scientifically outdo one another, and one of them involved digging as deep as possible into the Earth's crust. Naturally, the Soviet Union threw their hat in the ring, in 1970 taking the first step of what would ultimately be a 20-year journey. By the project's end, the hole they had created stood at roughly nine miles deep and would eventually become the deepest man-made hole ever created. And with such a title, it's no surprise how rumors and speculation about it began to crop up. People across the globe began to believe that the project had been abandoned due to something unexpected occurring. That the scientists who were drilling had suddenly found a hollow cavity all those miles beneath their feet. Said cavity was said to be hot. Extremely hot with some rumors saying temperatures of up to 2,000 degrees had been documented. As scientists tend to do, the ones in charge of this project allegedly lowered a microphone some way into the hole, and according to the story, what they heard upon replaying the tape was nothing short of nightmarish. In this recording were the sounds of voices screaming and wailing, layers upon layers of absolute chaos and agony. Some claim the researchers were driven mad by what they heard, ultimately resulting in the hole being closed up and never spoken of again. This version of events found its way around the globe very quickly in pre-internet times, settling amongst religious circles who claimed it was scientific proof of the existence of hell, as well as tabloids seeking a juicy headline for their next release. People soon began referring to this hole as the Well to Hell, with its alleged location being somewhere in Siberia. Naturally, the story found itself on radio as well, most notably being discussed in the late 90s on a paranormal talk show called AM Coast to Coast. After taking some calls from listeners about the topic, host Art Bell dropped a bombshell, revealing that he had recently received an email from a listener who had a copy of the infamous recording. The following is a recreation of that broadcast. Now I've got a clean copy of it now, and I warn you, this could scare you. Here's the email. Dear Art Bell, I just started listening to your radio show and could not believe it when you talked about the sounds from hell tonight. My uncle had told me this story a couple of years ago and I didn't believe him, like one of your listeners, 
who discounted the story as nothing more than a religious newspaper fabricated account. The story about the digging, the hearing of sounds from hell, is very real. It did occur in Siberia. My uncle collected video and so forth on the paranormal, supernatural. He passed away fairly recently, but he would have loved your show. He had me listen to one of the audio tapes he had on the sounds from hell in Siberia, and I copied it. He received his copy from a friend who worked at the BBC. It took me a while to find it tonight, but attached is the sound from my uncle's tapes. It's not the greatest quality, but the sounds are there. I was very hesitant to send you this, as the sound bothers me to listen to. I suggest that if you do play it on the program, warn listeners in advance, so that they may have the option of turning the radio off for 30 seconds while it plays. It has always haunted me. To those who discounted the Siberia Sounds from Hell story, it is true, and I for one wish it wasn't. Rick, listening from Chicago. And so I submit now a better copy to you. And I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. The story of the well to hell is something that has endured the test of time, now in the modern day making its home online. And while it's definitely a fun story rooted in real life, it goes without saying that more than a few creative liberties were taken in the name of forging this version of events. As we've established, the hole is a very real thing, but instead of a fiery pit, it currently sits abandoned and bolted shut, something made possible by its 9 inch diameter, a long shot from the mental image the story might have given you. Its official name is the Kola Superdeep Borehole, Kola being a place in Russia bordering Norway. For reference, this is not in fact in Siberia like the story claims, and to add on top of that, the Smithsonian claims that temperatures inside the hole were roughly 365 degrees Fahrenheit, a far cry from the alleged 2000. They also add that this was higher than expected, the researchers only anticipating temperatures of roughly 200 degrees. The article makes a claim that this is why the project was ultimately abandoned, while other sources like the BBC claim it was due to the fall of the Soviet Union. It is entirely possible that both of these explanations are true, but regardless, it's not hard to see where the story of hellish temperatures causing researchers to flee had actually come from. And there is admittedly something inherently creepy about the idea of a nine mile deep hole in the earth, even if it's not one that you couldn't possibly fall into. There's something to be said for the fact that time and time again, we as a species find ourselves so captivated by other worlds that we seem to always find new ways to reinvent stories about pathways to them. Whether you believe in them or not, they seem to be embedded in our imaginations and culture alike, and seem to not be going anywhere anytime soon. Now, personally, I always tend to lean towards skepticism, but as a child growing up in the rural Philippines, I'd always hear my folks tell kids not to play hide-and-seek at night, lest they be whisked away by some inhuman beings and taken to another world. Whether or not that's a widespread folk belief, or just something my family concocted, I'd be lying if I said that the idea didn't stick with me, and that it didn't sort of creep me out to this very day. 